fact, I've, I've been taking Charlie all the way down to Florida City every Monday and Friday, and my commute back this this Friday was so much better than it was just one week ago. So there are some benefits to time change. Mm -hmm. It does affect different people, but it just reduced traffic somehow. So. I, mean, I don't know, I might write the lady in Idaho and tell her don't change things after all. I uh, might want to just stick with the the uh, annoying time change every year. How many of y'all have ever missed something major because of time change and just not setting your clocks back? Anybody here ever had it get you? Mason, you have? Yeah. yeah. I okay. can't remember what, but sure. You, you hope so, right? I've always, time change has terror. I'm, I'm a timely person. I don't like being late for things. And time change absolutely terrorizes people like me. Who worry about being on time? So I just wake up all night, every night, ah, yeah. every hour, and then I get up and I try to ask myself, did I reset the clock on the stove? You know, the stove is like everybody's, you know, the official time. And so yeah. then I always worry about what if I set the time, what if I set the stove clock and then Melissa set the stove clock, you know, and then what if we changed it two hours? So I really don't know what time it is. And then when, then when the cell phones came out and they started automatically updating time on you, I mean, there's just no way to know whether somebody fixed the clock or messed up the clock. But I have a funny story about time change uh, that happened in college sometime. It wasn't. It was a prank. And if you'd like to hear about it, I'll give it to you on your own time, if you'd like. <laughs> so anyway, Brother Dave Ang Angusath is going to come up after our last song, and I want you to have as much time as possible. So all the announcements that are necessary are in the church bulletin, and to, so you, you avail yourself of that. Make sure you know what's going on and what's up and coming. Okay, Taj, why don't you come on? Mm -hmm. Oh, we got to do an offering. Yeah. Charlie, why don't you come on? <laughs> Find the offering book. All right. It's great. Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, I pray now that as we give, Lord, that you would bless. Uh, we'll be able to see much of what comes in. I praise in Jesus' name. Amen. song hymn number 332 hymn number 332 by Jesus I love you Savior art thou, if ever 
bunch of scriptures tonight, so I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Some of these uh, I might not normally have you turn to, but boy, like this one, you need to know where this verse is. This would be one of those top of the list for you to memorize, I would think. Uh, before I get started, I want to make sure that everybody gets a couple of these greeting cards that are at the back. My wife's a watercolor artist. She's done all these cards. They have scripture on the front, inside, and the back, and they have the plan of salvation on the back. So it's a great way to witness to somebody. There's, I don't know exactly what's back there, but she's got birthday cards and thank you cards and encouragement cards, and several of the cards are actually blank. So you can put your own message in it, and it can be for any occasion, an anniversary, a wedding, whatever, get well. But pray about it and send a couple of these out, okay? It's not going to cost you anything but the stamp. And it's a pretty nice card. They got, I mean, once you see them, they're phenomenally good cards. They actually got an old-fashioned hymn on every card inside and the words to that powerful hymn and a little two, three-sentence biography about the person that wrote the hymn. So that in itself doesn't require much more of a message. It's a great witnessing tool. Take advantage of them. We want you to be a part of our ministry and we'll be a part of your ministry as you send those out. So uh, we'll look at a verse of scripture here and then we'll pray and then we'll get into the message. My ulterior motive here tonight, Pastor knows this already, is I'm hoping that you guys, uh, I, I whet your appetite so maybe that next year when I come back, I'm already booked from this point forward before we go home at the end of March, beginning of April. But um, I'm hoping to actually do a longer meeting here next year. We'll plan it ahead of time maybe. If it works out, because I know that's a busy time for you anyway. But our plan next year is to be down here for three to four months. I sure would like to do like an all day Sunday or a couple days or three days in the middle of the week or something like that. Because there's a lot we can learn about understanding about clay. And I'll get into that a little bit tonight. So let's look at this one verse. To me, I, I use this verse, I refer to probably half the messages I preach. Just because I think it's such a great verse. Uh, Revelation 4 verse 11. The Bible says, this is the four and twenty elders. They're worshiping God up in the throne, up in heaven. And they're, they're I think in unison, they're crying out to him, uh, O Lord, thou art, excuse me. Uh, how does that verse go? Thou art, worthy, that? Lord. thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay? Why do I like that verse? It tells you and me why we're here. Why did God create us? What are we doing here? Simply put, to bring Him pleasure. We were created to bring God pleasure. And it tells us right in that verse one of the ways that we can please Him. If we will do things that glorify Him, that pleases Him. As well as things that demonstrate his power working through us, okay? So that's where we're starting. Let's pray, and then we'll uh, get into the message here. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the, uh, the day you've given us, the strength to come out to church tonight. Thank you for this facility and a, and a uh, place that you provided, Lord, that this little part of the local body might gather uh, several times a week to, to, to pray for, uh, to you, to worship you, Father, in song and in, uh, in thanksgiving. And then honestly uh, look into your words and draw closer to you from what they hear from the preacher and what they learn from your book. So Lord, we thank you for all of those things. I thank you for each and every soul that you brought here this evening, Lord. And I pray that you'd use me as your mouthpiece to minister to those that you've seen fit to bring here this evening. Lord, I pray you do the teaching and the preaching and that you help me to say only those things that are right and that are pleasing to you. And Lord, we ask it all for your benefit, for your honor and your glory and your pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to get started here a little bit. And um, I'm trying to think of the best story. I want to mention this right up front. I'll catch up with sometimes what I'm doing and explain myself as I get going here. But I really want to make something real quick here. I want to ask you something. I don't want any response, but I want you to question yourself. Did you pray tonight before you came to church? that God would speak to you through who's ever preaching here, usually Pastor Price. I hope you did. Uh, that's how God works. 
God works through a man to speak to men, women, and children. And he's done that all throughout man's history. He uses a man to speak to groups. And the Bible says in Ephesians that uh, this part of his local body, you've been given a gift, the gift of a pastor teacher. It's a gift to you. Take advantage of that gift. And before you get here, at least on Sunday morning and Wednesday night, be praying that God would specifically speak to you through your pastor because that's what he wants to do. And then if you come with that mindset, chances are God will have something on Pastor Ryan's heart or who's ever up here that will speak to you exactly as he wants to communicate to you. So that's a, a question for you. Uh, the other question I want to ask you is uh, we just read in Revelation uh, 4 the purpose for our existence to bring God pleasure. I think the greatest discovery any person can make, understanding that God has a plan for you, all right, a plan of a specific way that you and only you can really bring him a specific kind of pleasure that he created you to do, okay? That's why he made us all individual, all unique, mm -hmm. that he's got certain things that we're going to be equipped to do. Now, I'm making a little vase here. And I'm trying to make something very similar to what I've already got up here. I've got one up here, it's kind of hard because it's been drying. This one is actually very soft. And that's the only difference in the color. They're both made out of the same clay. But as the moisture comes out of this little vessel, okay, very soft, it actually lightens, but it's hard. You might think, well, it's finished, but it's not. And I want to demonstrate this, and I'll get back to it later. But when I set this in this little jar of water, you're going to see over the next 10, 15 minutes that that clay is going to dissolve. Why? Because it hasn't been through the entire clay process. All right? That'll make more sense in a while. So I hope that you would pray selfishly, even tonight right now, in your mind, that God would reveal, uh, maybe during this message, maybe later tonight, sometime in the near future, if he hasn't already, that God would reveal to you what his perfect will is for you individually. That may be, seem like a selfish prayer, but it really isn't. God does want to reveal his will to you. And he's going to do it primarily through your circumstances, but through the pages of that book that he's given us. And you just can't spend too much time in that book. So I think that's the greatest discovery that man can make, discovering what God's will is for him. I think God gave us, he hardwired every single one of his creatures, uh, especially human creatures, with a kind of a, a mindset that is, has curiosity as part of it. I don't know about you, I think most people have at least a degree of curiosity. I know history is full of people that have spent their life searching for things, trying to discover something different, something new. I mean, uh, you know, we all know about Columbus and how he discovered North America. We know about Ponce de Leon, right? He, he discovered uh, Florida, looking for the Fountain of Youth, I think. Uh, but all throughout history, man has, has had that curiosity. I think that's because God wants us to be curious about why we're here. And he tells us right in that Bible to bring him pleasure. He also wants us to get curious and maybe discover more that we can learn about God, and especially how we relate to God, okay? So maybe different ways specifically that we can please Him, specific ways that we can glorify Him and honor Him and demonstrate His power working through us. So the greatest discovery is not some archaeologist that has been digging uh, over there in uh, Asia or somewhere in some country across the water there for years looking for some ancient artifact. It's not some astronaut out in space trying to find uh, you know, life on another planet or anything like that. It's not some chemist tucked away in some building trying to uh, uh, discover how to extend life of human, man, of human beings. The greatest discovery you can make is to find God's will. And then of course hand in hand with that, probably the most, uh, the best knowledge you could ever attain to is to understand exactly how that will relates to you. And then thirdly, the greatest achievement you could hope for is to perform God's will for your life. And the truth of the matter is, it's not us performing that will. It's God's going to perform his perfect will through us. 
once we find out what it is and then allow him step by step to prepare us to perform that perfect will through us. So I'm going to use clay as kind of a metaphor to drive home that statement and why that's important. So what is it about clay? Well, I'll back up a little bit and tell you about my personal testimony because uh, I made a profession of faith. I did not grow up in a Christian home, but I did make a profession of faith. I was in about my mid-20s, and I was up in Minnesota where I was raised, and I was um, hanging out with some um, people from uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, I believe it was called. I think that was an offshoot of Billy Graham's ministry, one of his ministries. And anyway, I, I noticed something different about those people, and I started hanging out with them a little bit, went to some church services, maybe for the first time heard the gospel. And I say I made a profession. I never went down to an altar. Uh, I never made what I call a public profession. I was never baptized, okay? And none of that has to do with your salvation. I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, it's not required for salvation, let me put it that way. But uh, making a public profession, getting baptized, that's a great testimony, something you can kind of pin a nail on, so to speak, if you get saved. But I want to tell you this. Made a profession in my mid-20s, 30 years later, I finally surrendered to the Lord. And there's a big difference between you getting saved and you surrendering. Now, to get saved, you surrender to salvation, and that is a one-time deal. But for you to surrender, to surrender your life to serve the Lord, which is what he wants from all of his children, all of those that are saved, that's a daily, minute by minute, if you want to say it that way, decision that you can make or not make. You know, Paul, on the road to Damascus, uh, the first words out of his mouth after he got saved was, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And that's the mindset a surrendered person should have every single day when they wake up. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? So, big difference, save and surrender. What happened in, in 2003, now I'm in my mid-50s, I surrendered to the Lord. He leads me to go to Bible school. I went to Bible school up in Pensacola. Shortly after I got out of Bible school, he put me in full-time ministry doing what I'm doing right here, making pottery and preaching. And I started out with one very long message that now when I go into churches, I take three whole sessions to do that. Okay, and that's about the judgment seat of Christ and the fact that Christians... People that are saved, people that are born again because you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone for your eternal salvation, they will stand before one God one day and give an account of their works. We'll cover that a few verses before we close tonight. So I get into ministry, and of course He's got me doing what? Making pottery, because God doesn't waste anything. You see, all those years I was saved but not surrendered, I was making pottery, and that's how I earned my living. To this point, I've probably been making pottery now for a little over 42 years, I would say. I've got the numbers right. So uh, the pottery is not a problem for me. It's the preaching, you know. So, uh, and my pottery does suffer a little bit when I am preaching, but I don't have to pay too much attention, and I don't pay too much attention to what I'm making up here. Uh, God's not a waster of anything. He used clay, and I'm going to justify that. And to do so, why don't you turn to Isaiah, chapter 64. Old Testament, Isaiah 64. You know, if we read our Bibles, the Bible says that, uh, I think Christ said it, something like, all men like sheep have gone astray. Um, there's, there's verses in the Bible that liken men to trees. You know, if we learn about trees, we can probably learn a lot about man. If we learn about sheep, we can learn about men. Well, doesn't it stand to reason if we were made out of clay that we could learn a lot about man and God, the one who shaped us, if we learn about clay? And I, I thank God he gave me this unique ministry because part of the big thing with me going to Bible school, it was not to get into ministry. That was the furthest thing from my mind. I was very opposed to getting up in front of people and speaking. I have been my whole life, and I was actually 
even through my first several years of evangelism, okay? I've just recently gotten somewhat comfortable being up here, okay? And I hope it comes across because now I'm really starting, after getting into my 11th year, starting to kind of enjoy myself. And that's, there's nothing wrong. I, I think Pastor Price enjoys himself when he's involved in ministry. You know why? Because right now, that's God's perfect will for his life. Right now, today, maybe not tomorrow, but right now, today, this is God's perfect will for me. And boy, he said he's going to give us our heart's desire. You know, all those years I was saved but not surrendered, I had a pretty good life. I thought I was leading my heart's desire. I, you know, I was making pots all day. You say, well, turn about that. I love to make pots, okay? I can make whatever I want. I had a little studio an hour up the road from, here from Stewart, Florida. We had that studio for about 30 years. And I could make whatever I wanted to. And we had we just put the shit things on the shelf, put a price tag on them. Not everything sold, but I had thousands of pieces of pottery in there. We made a good living from it. Got to be so good at working on the potter's wheel that after a while, I didn't even have to work full time at that. I could play golf a lot. I could. We had a summer studio up in North Carolina. We'd go up there and make some pots up there and do art shows up there to get rid of the pottery and play some more golf up there and whatever. You know, it was just... God blessed me tremendously. I like making pottery. I thought that was my heart's desire, making pottery, playing golf. Uh-uh. It was temporarily satisfying, temporarily fulfilling, but nothing long-term, nothing lasting. And you know what? It was all about me and nothing about him. Even when God blessed us financially, I didn't use that money to reach out to other people that were less fortunate. I just got a bigger car or added on to the house or took another vacation or whatever. I used it all for me, and I'm ashamed to say that, but it's the truth. God blesses you exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think for a reason. If you've got excess money, it's probably because God wants you to use that uh, to reach out to someone that's less fortunate, to show the love of Christ uh, working through you. But it's hard to do that, hard to even have that mindset if you're not surrendered. So, all those years up in Stewart, I thought I had it, but I wasn't. I wasn't in God's perfect will, that's for sure. And now he's given me a ministry to where get, what I get to do. I still get to make pottery. And I like it. I don't have to do all the finished work, the glazing and all the pricing and all this other stuff, which I never enjoyed anyway. This is the part I really like. Just making the stuff on the wheel and uh, shaping it. I just enjoy the process. God's got something for you to do. It says here in Isaiah 64, 8. This is Isaiah crying out to the Lord. He says, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou art potter. We are all the work of thy hand. A lot of information there. It says God's a potter and we're not like clay or as clay. He said we are clay. And that goes hand in hand with Genesis 2, 7. When the Bible said the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That dust that he made Adam out of was clay. Uh, the name Adam means red-brown earth. So he formed us out of clay. He used his hands to do it. We are the work of thy hand. It even says in Genesis that he formed man of the dust of the ground. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me a couple things. Number one, I know that clay is the single most abundant solid material on planet Earth. What's the message for you and me? The message is, you're not too special. God made you out of something that's readily available, has virtually no value unless it's processed, and, you know, it's clay. He didn't say, I'm going to make man, he's so special, I'm going to make him out of gold or silver or some exotic hardwood that when you polish it and shape it and you know, makes really pretty now, clay. Get that message. Unless, unless God takes possession of your vessel of clay, you're not worth anything to God. You may think you are to yourself, but you're not in God's eyes. God made us out of clay. He didn't speak us into existence like he could have. He used his hands because he has concern for us. So there's verses in the, uh, the Bible that says that God planted the ear. God formed the eye. I can see God up there, you know, shaping all these little parts and putting them together. He might even use a potter's wheel to start with this whole thing. I don't know, because he said, 
It says in the Bible, thy hands have fashioned me and uh, made me and fashioned me together round about. That's what Job said. So we're made out of clay. Job knew it. Job said, thy hands have made me and fashioned me together round about. Thou hast made me as the clay. Wilt thou bring me to dust again? Folks, we can learn a lot about clay. As a matter of fact, the DNA of man and the DNA of clay are virtually identical. Those are very long lists. There's about 60 items in each list, and the percentages are different, but except for the last two or three items in each list, they're exactly the same items. You and I are made out of clay. Adam was, we're descendants of Adam, we are made out of clay. Um, back in the 90s, when scientists up in New England were going to create life in the laboratory, they came down here, not too far from where I had my pottery studio. They actually went out into the Florida Everglades. And they got themselves some miry clay. That's what they were going to start with so that they could create life in the laboratory. You know, if they would have been able to, which they weren't, the joke would have been on them because they still started with something God made. Mm -hmm. He made the clay. Okay? Um, Think about this, you don't have to turn there, but the ninth chapter in the Gospel of John, you may be familiar with it, that entire chapter is concerned about Jesus Christ healing a man that was born blind. If you know the story, by the way, I think that's the only miracle that he did in the Bible that's recorded that is given a whole chapter for nothing else, only it. And, uh, but if you know anything about that, that exact story, how he healed that man that was born blind, he had him take some clay, and he had put that on his eyes, anointed his eyes with that clay, he says, and then he rushed, took the clay off and went and washed the residue, and then he could see. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to realize when God created that man in the first place, created him blind for his glory that he might heal him in the future, uh, he just left a few of those missing DNA ingredients that were necessary for that eye to operate. And then when that clay was physically put on his eyes, maybe that DNA just absorbed into his eyes and he was good to go. Seems logical to me. Uh, look at clay and man. They're very similar in a lot of ways. Generally speaking, clay comes in all kinds of different colors. Isn't that a lot like man? Man comes in all kinds of colors and textures for that matter. You know, clay, when it's mined, it's hard and it's contaminated. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. I'm going to show you some clay here that's been dug out of the ground. Now clay is nothing more than the ground. While well, you're finding Jeremiah 18. If you were to see this clay up close, you would see that uh, when you start taking a shovel and just digging clay out of the ground, you're not going to just get 100% clay as a rule. It'd be pretty rare. You're going to get things like twigs, pieces of paper, there's sand, there's rocks in here, there's leaves, there's probably other contaminants because this is nothing more than the ground. And animals live on that ground, they travel over that ground, other animals fly over that area, and sometimes they deposit things, if I don't have to get too graphic, okay, that aren't clay. So it's contaminated. Even the clay, some of it is in kind of balls of clay that need to be broken down. Now since the clay is just the ground, and by the way, I, I said it's a single most abundant material, you could, in Florida, you might dig down a little bit. I know you're usually going to get sand, but there's different areas where you'll get, especially in northern Florida, we get a lot of fine porcelain up there. There's clay everywhere. It's, it's under that ocean up there. It's under the volcanoes. It's under the mountains. In North Carolina, especially Georgia, places like that, usually right on the surface of the ground, within a few inches, you're going to come across clay. And if it's just rained out, that clay is very sticky. That's one of the characteristics of clay. But clay, in order to be processed, needs to be dried out. So I just brought you dried out clay. It's hard. It's contaminated. Before we get to Jeremiah, let me tell you a few other things. Uh, because it's hard and contaminated, Clay has to go through a series of stages. As a matter of fact, it's an eight-stage process to get clay so you can shape it into other things. Because if it's processed, as you can see, it's shapeable. I don't think uh, even the youngest child in here probably realizes there's no way I could take this over to the potter's wheel and hope to shape anything with it, right? It's not, not going to hold together. 
but once it's processed, now it's able to come on this wheel and then go through a few more stages and actually end up like one of these finished vessels out here. So, why does it important for the clay to go through a process so the potter can shape it? So they can use it for those different purposes. Now sometimes the clay has a different purpose and it goes through a slightly different process. Keep in mind, let's say you're going to make brick, which is primarily clay. You don't have to do a whole lot of processing, but it still has to be processed. So you can pour it into the molds or whatever. But that process is going to be a lot different than the process you're going to put clay through if you're going to use that clay to make dentures. Okay, and that's what dentures are made out of. They're made out of porcelain, which is a type of clay. And that process is going to be a lot different than the process that we'd use to make kitty litter, which is also made out of clay, which would be different for the process you would use if you're going to use your clay to put the tiles on the space shuttle. And that's what the space shuttle has. It has clay tiles on it. And it's something about that clay that can withstand that incredibly high temperature when that space shuttle re-enters the atmosphere and has that tremendous heat build up because of the friction. And those t tiles are going to be totally different process than you would process the clay to make something like kale pectate, which has also got a lot of clay in it. You know, kaolin is a type of clay, and that's where kale pectate gets its name. Do you know that the glossy pages on a magazine differ from like newspaper, which is not glossy, has to do with a clay coating process. I mean, there's hundreds of different uses for clay, but I want to get into some specific pictures. So look at Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18, this is the famous potter in the clay passage, and it says in Jeremiah 18 too, he's an Old Testament prophet, the Lord speaks to him often, and he says in verse 2 of Jeremiah 18, arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Now, I don't know about you, but if that was me in my unsurrendered state, I'd say, Lord, I can hear you perfectly fine. What do I have to get up and go down to the potter's house for? Well, I'll tell you why he wanted Jeremiah to go down there. He had a very important message for him. It was about the nation of Israel and the fact that God said, hey, my judgment is about to come upon the nation because they've been disobedient to me. So I want you to go down to the potter's house because the message I want you to give them is so important. I don't want you to just hear it from me. I want you to see it. People, secular teachers, tell us that a person remembers only 10% of what they hear one time. On average, that can be really discouraging. 10%? Now, if you add something visual to that audible, that learning or retention or remembrance goes up by 500%. So that's a big deal. He wanted them to see the message, not just hear it. As a matter of fact, you could read the entire 18th chapter of Jeremiah and the potter never said a word. Now the Lord spoke to Jeremiah down there, but the big part of the message was what he saw. Verse 3, Jeremiah doesn't hesitate. He said, then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And then verse 4 is the one you really need to see. It says that the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Now, I mentioned this before when I preached from this pulpit, that God's words are very important. They're special, they're perfect, and there's an importance to them that requires that we understand what God means by those words. So the word marred, what does that mean to you? To me, it might have meant years ago that the potter was working on the wheel and maybe he bumped into the thing and you could say he put a blemish in it or a mark or a whatever you want to call it. You could say he marred it and that would be okay between you and me, but that's not what God means when he uses that word. How do I know that? The same way you should know that because the Bible tells you what those words mean. It just so happens the word marred is used five times in our Bible. And the principle of first mention where it's first used in the Bible is usually where you can find the definition. You see that blemish, the potter could straighten that right out. You wouldn't even know it ever happened. But when something was marred, by the way, that first mention is Isaiah. It talks about how the visage, the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in the future, some 600 years after Isaiah was writing, would be marred more than that of any man. If you have any uh, idea of what Jesus Christ looked like before he even got on that cross, and then as he was on the cross, with his skin virtually removed and the organs hanging out, I mean, he no longer even looked human. 
It wasn't a blemish by any means. Here's what Jeremiah saw. He saw the potter working on some type of a vessel, probably very symmetrical, but then at some point it got a little asymmetrical, started to wobble a little bit, and then got a little worse and worse, and pretty soon it was marred in the hand of the potter. And that's what he saw. He saw that thing totally destroyed like that, come apart in his hands. He saw the potter then take that clay, that lump of clay which used to be a vessel, and push it back down as hard as he could into the potter's wheel. And then he saw this. He saw the potter take that clay and pluck it off the wheel. Take it over to his wedging table. What's a wedging table? It's a strong table that's got an absorbent surface on it. And it's usually got a wire attached to it that the potter can cut the clay without having to take his hands off the clay. So I'll take this lump of clay and I'll cut it with this wire. And when you see this inside of it, you can see that there's different air pockets that are there. As a matter of fact, let me just open this up a little bit because they're all through here. Okay? It's humanly impossible for a potter to take a vessel that he shaped on the potter's wheel and push that vessel back down into a solid lump. It's, it's impossible for a human being to do that. Uh, that potter is going to trap air, all different folds in there. And what's air like? Think of air inside of a balloon. When the air can't get out, it just it's just almost for a potter with an air pocket, it's just like a, a, the air in a balloon. There's no place for it to escape. Now if it gets close to the side and he's pressing real hard, he might pop through it. But then what happens? All of a sudden there's a big <coughs> void in that particular area where there was air. So that's the problem. Number two, there's another problem. If you've been watching me shape the vessel of clay on the potter's wheel, you've seen that uh, I'm using a lot of water. That allows the clay to slide in my fingers instead of sticking to the clay. Now as I'm using that water, the surfaces, which would be the exterior wall and the interior wall, those surfaces that are actually receiving the water, they're getting softer and softer. Whereas the interior of the wall is still the same firmness it started. So there's two things a potter cannot have. He cannot have a solid lump of clay that has any contaminants in it, an air pocket, a stone, or anything like that. He can also has to have that clay with the exact same consistency of firmness throughout the entire lump of clay. Okay, it's like it has to be homogenized. Now look at perfectly smooth. Why? Because the potter's cutting the clay, he's pulling it down, compressing it, and he's wedging it on this wedging table. This is one of the stages that the clay has to go through. Now, if you're paying attention, Who's the potter? God. Who's the clay? We are. Is this something you think you want to go through? That's you and me. And that's God. What's he doing? He had to take us off the potter's wheel. And now he's doing what he's got to do. He's working you over. And believe me, you don't want to do this more than you have to. I don't. You think I'm uh, adding to the scriptures. Look down at verse 7. Keep in mind, this was the message for Jerusalem. At the end of verse 7 of chapter 18 of Jeremiah, he says he's going to pluck them up, he's going to pull them down, he's going to destroy them. So this is exactly what Jeremiah saw. Now I'm going to put this back on the wheel because the verse in 18.4 says, the vessel that he's made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. It doesn't say he made the same vessel. It also doesn't say that the potter marred the clay. Look at that verse. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So the message for you and I, the spiritual application in the year 2018 for you and I, is that if we allow unconfessed, unrepented sins to accumulate one on top of another on top of another, it's a picture of this vessel of clay that God is trying to shape us into becoming marred in the hand of the potter. It's our fault. And so what does God have to do? It gets to a certain point where he's got to take you up off the potter's wheel, which is stage five, and put you back over here to stage three, which is the wedging of the clay. Okay? Uh, and of course, I get this comment several times when I've done this illustration. People will come up to me and say, Brother Angus, uh, 
I recognize that picture you've shown about the, the vessel that had to be plucked up and taken off the, the wheel and put back you know, on the wedging table and worked over. I've, I've seen that in my, since that in my own life, and I've noticed where God maybe put me on the shelf for a while and allowed me to go through some circumstances that were not so pleasant. And, uh, but, but the most discouraging thing, brother, is that I realize I can no longer fulfill God's plan A for my life. You know what? That's true. But that shouldn't paralyze you. Because God's plan B for your life is far greater than you can imagine. Far greater than anything you could ever hope for. As a matter of fact, I'm on plan J, K, L, somewhere in there, by my estimation. And I hope I don't go any further. But his plans, I don't care what letter of the alphabet you're on, it's better than you could ever attain on your own or even imagine for yourself. He didn't say he made the same vessel. He made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. I think of us instead of fo focusing on the negative aspect of that picture, because it is negative, sin is negative, uh, we could think of the positive aspect of the picture of the marred clay the fact that God didn't throw away the clay. How positive is that? That demonstrates God's love, God's mercy, God's long-suffering toward us. That he does love us enough to give us a second and third and eighth and ninth and tenth and twenty-first chance or whatever it may be. Now there could be a point where he said, enough's enough. I'll be honest with you, I've actually never mentioned this before, but as I mentioned, you do soften the clay every time you're working on it. So it does get to the point, let's face it, after eight or nine times where, I mean, you can wedge it and wedge it and wedge it, and then, of course, what you'd have to do is actually let it sit out for a while and do nothing with it. Because it's got to dry out and firm up somewhere. You just can't, it's just so buttery, you just can't, has no strength to be shaped. I guess the message is, if you would be sensitive to what God is doing in your life through these circumstances that he allows us to go through, these trials, if you sense God wedging you, he's working you over, hey, he's trying to show you something. He's trying to teach you something. And if we become sensitive to that, maybe we'll only have to do it once or twice instead of five or six or seven or eight times. Because all he's going to do is prolong and intensify what he puts you through if he loves you enough and has enough invested in you where he wants to get that pleasure out of your life that he knows he's capable of bringing himself through you, you got to just let go and yield to him and allow him to perform his perfect will through you. He cares that much. He loves us that much that he's willing to chasten us and put us through things that if you wouldn't put your own children through maybe because you don't have the stomach for it, but he does. He loves us that much, cares for us that much. Let's look at a couple other pictures here. I want to show you some concrete pictures. We already saw this one. This is a picture, by the way, the potter, the first thing he has to do to dig the clay out of the ground. You know what I think I'll do? I think I'll go through real quickly the eight stages that a potter puts a clay out, and then we'll just put some clay through, and then we'll just pick out a couple of those to give you a picture that you can take with you, something you can learn from. So the first one was this. He uh, dug the clay out of the ground. That's a picture of salvation. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 40, verse 2, the Bible says, He brought me up also out of the mire, out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. Okay? Digging the clay out of the ground is a picture of salvation. And it's a picture of faith as well. Of course, I told you the clay is hard and contaminated when it comes out of the ground. So what does the potter do? The earthly potter takes that clay and puts it in a huge vat of water. And those hard, uh, some of those things that float, like the paper and the twigs, branches, those stuff are scraped off the top. Some things go right to the bottom, like stones and rocks. Those are removed. He takes what's ever left, pours that vat of water and all that other stuff, including the clay, into another vat, uh, but through a fine mesh screen. And all that will go through that screen are the water molecules and the clay. And what he ends up with is something like right here. Now, this was pure clay, and that's exactly what he ends up with. A whole bunch of water on top of a small amount of pure clay. He pours off that excess water. 
This is called the weathering process because actually the way God set up the weather patterns, this can occur naturally. God's behind it, but it does occur naturally through rain and erosion and things like that. And that's why you will find pockets of pure clay because every single element, everything God has ever created has a specific, a specific gravity to it. And if they're suspended and stirred up violently, like happened during the Noah's flood, the worldwide flood, that's why you travel through the Grand Canyon, you're going to see different stratas of things. Because those things that are mixed up violently, they tend to all settle according to their specific gravity. And you will get layers of the same thing mixed in with trees upside down and all kinds of stuff. So don't think that the Grand Canyon, I was just reading a book about how, how it took millions of years for this tiny little river to erode. And there's the Grand Canyon. No, not quite. Anyway. The potter takes that clay, which is pure now, it's ready to go, except for what? It's too, too mushy. So he takes that, pours it on his wedging table, maybe dries it out, puts a fan on it. Uh, what happens, though, is the surface areas get a little too firm, and the inside is still a little too soft. When the potter thinks it's just a good combination, he takes those pieces of clay. It's a big pancake, so he peels them off, and they're in, uh, you know, just pieces of pancake like this but they're still a little soft in some areas, a little too firm in other areas, and that's when he takes them over to the table and wedges them up. Okay, I'm not gonna do it. You already saw me wedge the clay. Then he takes that wedged clay and he sets it to rest for a while. What's that? That is, the reason you don't have to, I didn't have to do this step when I took this clay and, uh, that I wedged up and, and shaped another vessel out of, is because when clay is made from a powder, just from regular clay, right from this, to this, to this, it has to rest for a while. There's something about the molecules of clay, they're long skinny rectangles. Each one of those long skinny rectangles is surrounded by thousands of little ball bearings of water. Okay, and those things slide on one another. But they get their stickiness when bacteria grows on those molecules of clay and water, okay? And if that doesn't have time for that bacteria to grow, you're not gonna get the stickiness needed to shape something on the potter's wheel. The potter takes that clay that's been dug out, decontaminated, softened, cleansed, he wedges it, he rests it, and then he takes it on the potter's wheel and shapes it into a vessel. And he lets that vessel sit for a while and dry and it gets hard, and then it goes into a kiln and then he fires it. And it gets harder than it is right here. Guess what else? It's hard enough in that kiln that's an oven so that it will not dissolve. This is a, goes to about 1800 degrees, much higher than the hottest setting on your oven at home. This will never get soft again because it's been uh, shrunk and chemically changed by the intense heat of that kiln. That's a very important step, that uh, stage, we call it the low firing stage, because the next step is to take that low firing piece of pottery and dip it into a big bucket that's got water, and chemicals in it. It looks like a big vat of milk if it's white, or it could be different colors, gray or blue or whatever, greenish. But they're all kind of subtle colors. Those chemicals mixed with the water are chemicals that when they are heated, they actually form glass on the surface. Potters call that glaze. Now you can imagine, I can't dip this in the bucket of glaze because it'll get soft, it'll melt on me. Then the potter takes that glaze vessel puts it in the kiln again, this time it goes up to about 2200 degrees, and now you can tell a different sound there, a higher sound, because it's harder. It's been heated even hotter, and the glaze which was on the surface is now bonded into the pores of the vessel. Very hard, even hard to chip. It's literally bonded to that stoneware pot, very durable. So, dug out, not usable has to go through a process. It's softened and cleansed. It's wedged. It's rested. God shapes it. It's low fire. The glaze is put on, and then it's high fire, turning that glaze into a glass surface on the coating. This is the same glaze on both pieces of pottery. This one is fired. This isn't. If I fired this, it would look just like that. Same colors. These two are identical. I could wash this pot off in with water. You can actually see some of the pink showing through. This is actually a brown clay. This is a white clay. It's kind of gray in this form. If it's fired, it turns white. 
this was actually made out of brown pay that gets a little pinkish during the first fire and gets a little darker in the final fire. Anyway, that's the H stage clay process. Well, here's the first picture, a picture of faith. How about this next picture? A picture of us. I'm telling you something. You can be in here this evening. You can be born again. You can be trusting the Lord Jesus Christ and Him only for your salvation, and that means you're saved and you're going to be in heaven one day. But if you have not allowed God to process you in all eight of these stages, which is a picture of the sanctification process, and you know what he's looking at spiritually in your heart? It's like this. It's like Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, God wants to soften you and cleanse you. And it's just like the potter. He uses water to soften and cleanse the clay. Since we're made out of clay, is it any different that God would use water to cleanse us? The water of the Word. Uh, Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, that God loved the church, that's us, the body of believers, gave his life for it, that he might sanctify it, this is the sanctification process, and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of the water by the word of God. This Bible says in Psalm 119, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. These words are supernatural, and they literally have the power to soften our heart and to clean it. I mean, that's what the Bible tells us. How does it work? Well, it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As you and I are reading our Bibles, these supernatural words, which it says in these, this Bible, are discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart, at Hebrews 4, 12, those words will bring to our conscious mind sin that we're guilty of and we need to repent and confess and forsake that of course we can ignore that and just allow that heart to get dirty and dirtier and eventually be marred in the hand of the potter or we can do what we should confess forsake for repent the bible says if we do those things he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that's the way that works um how about another picture a couple more uh the shaping process let me take this thing of clay just finish this up a little bit. I'll give you a couple other pictures that are uh, <clears throat> kind of evident when the potter's shaping clay on the wheel. If anybody in here actually tried working on a potter's wheel? Whoa, okay. I think you'll verify what I'm about to tell the others and, and you, and that the hardest thing was for me and most potters that I know. Uh, the hardest thing to learn on a potter's wheel is how to get that clay in the center. And just like this is an eight-stage process that the potter puts the clay through, uh, when you get onto the wheel, there's about a five- or six-stage process of shaping it. These have to be done in order, and they have to be done correctly. Or down the line, here it's just going to show up, and, and it's not going to work. It's the same with shaping something on the wheel. The very first thing the potter has to do is center that clay, and that requires a lot of strength and knowing how to, you to overcome the strength of that wheel wanting to bounce you around. And the potter learns to push the clay up into kind of a cone. And the more he can do this and just raise it up like that, and then the more he can lower it by pushing it kind of sideways and down, pretty soon it gets absolutely centered. What do I mean by being centered? I mean that when the potter touches the surface of the clay while it's spinning, at any point, his finger should ride perfectly smooth on that pot and that lump of clay. If it's bouncing back and forth, you know it's not centered. Now, if you want to do something that means anything for the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I need to be centered on his perfect will. All right? Once the potter does shape the clay and it's got it centered, he drops the well. And then he opens the floor of the pot. He leaves about a quarter of an inch of clay on the surface down there, so he has a bottom. And then he begins to pull the cylinder up. And that's basically what he's doing. He takes fingers on the inside and fingers on the outside. He brings them together, and then he brings them a little further together so that as he raises up, it stretches that thick clay out, thins it out, and makes it taller. And almost every vessel on the potter's wheel starts as a thick cylinder and then eventually becomes a thinner and thinner cylinder, 
And then once he's got the cylinder, he can kind of just shape it however he wants. But I think the neat pictures here are the fact that isn't it nice to know that the master potter, no matter what that world is thrown against you, he's got a supporting hand inside of you as he's shaping you. Keep in mind this world, or I should say this potter's wheel, is a picture of the world. This potter wheel goes round and round and round. What's that a picture of? It's a picture of the earth going round and round and round. And God is going to shape you, not just through his words, but through the circumstances that he allows you to go, in, go through day after day after day. You think those little incidental things that you don't pay any attention to are by accident in your life? People that you might walk past in the supermarket? I think God's in control of everything. Every little circumstance or situation in your life, God's got a hand in that. And all of those, if we were super sensitive to the opportunities to reach out to other people, I'm not saying you are paralyzed by not being able to move in society. But we should be more sensitive than we are to just spending our day doing what we think we need to do. I got the blessing several years ago to spend uh, a whole week with a pastor before our meeting actually started. And uh, because I was on his property and stuff, he asked me if I wanted to go you know, help him do his uh, to-do list every day, which was to go to the supermarket and the drugstore and the laundromat and four or five other places, you know. And you know what it was? It wasn't him actually having to do anything there. That was his ministry. I mean, he might have had to make a bank deposit, but he didn't just go there and make his bank deposit. He went there and talked to the teller and the bank manager and whoever else he encountered, a customer. And of course, he'd been doing this for so many years, everybody in his town knew him. He'd go to the grocery store, and I don't even know if he bought anything. He just talked to several of the people working in there. That was his ministry. He did things, he accomplished things, he ran the errands he had to run, but they were secondary to him doing his ministry. He was very sensitive to God's opportunities just to befriend people, to be a witness and a testimony to them. I think it's nice to know not only does God have a supporting hand on the outside, but maybe you're struggling with some internal things. Uh, so not only is that that in, in, inside, he's got one on the outside. And sometimes maybe because of that internal struggle, he's got two supporting hands on the outside. He knows what we need, when we need it, and how much we need. The Bible says not only will he never leave me or forsake me, but you can trust on God to comfort you through any trial or affliction. He gives us a precious promise that says, uh, Psalm that he will not cause us to suffer above that we are able to withstand. I'm not quoting the verse exactly, but uh, it's in Corinthians. And he says, he'll make a way for us to escape that we may be able uh, to bear it. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make a way for you to escape that ye may be able to bear it. I mean, that's a precious promise. God is going to shape you on this wheel of life through the circumstances he puts you through. Find in the back of your Bible, 2 Peter. And then I'll give you a minute, and I want you to raise your hand once you've found 2 Peter. Once you find 2 Peter, it should be very easy to find 1 Peter. <laughs> now, the last picture I want to give you tonight is this picture of the fired vessel. I told you that glaze is literally bonded to the surface of the clay. This is actually a picture in the sanctification process of charity. And Paul said, we're going to read about Peter here, but Paul wrote in one of his epistles uh, to put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Here in Peter, 1 Peter 4, 8, the Bible says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And then skip down to verse 12. Peter writes, Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, 
but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. And then verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You know, this clay process actually puts the clay through two different firings. And actually in the sanctification process, God's going to put us through two different type of firings as well. But this final firing is a very intense firing. Why? God, God is going to ask us, he's going to give us opportunity to suffer for doing well. So if you're in 1 Peter, look in chapter 3, verse 17. 1 Peter 3, 17, For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. You know, it's not that big a deal to suffer for evil-doing, but when you're asked to suffer for well-doing, that's pretty hard to take. But that's what it means about partaking of God's divine nature of charity. So, I'm not going to have you turn to these verses, but I want to put something together for you as we close here. We already read Revelation 4.11, that God created us that we might bring him pleasure, and that we might bring him that pleasure by glorifying him. That's one of the ways we please him. And then in 1 John, not 1 John, but in John chapter 15, verse 8, he says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So that's one of the ways we can glorify him is to bear fruit. As a matter of fact, in John 15, 5, three verses earlier, Christ said, uh, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. You know what? I know you that I think that we can do something without the Lord Jesus Christ. But what he's really saying, the real principle here is, you can't do anything that matters without the Lord Jesus Christ, and he'll do it through you. Uh, but the real truth of the matter is, you can't do anything without Jesus Christ either, no matter what you think. So, we bring him pleasure by glorifying, we glorify him by bearing fruit, and then in Titus it says uh, that we need to be careful to maintain good works lest we become unfruitful. So us bearing fruit has got to do with our works, those good works. As a matter of fact, we know we're saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. He's ordained that if you are saved, he wants you to get out and do some good works, actually him doing them through you, that you can bear fruit and glorify him and bring him pleasure. It goes full circle, and it's a never-ending circle. You just keep going round and round and round and round. Listen, let's look at one more. Yeah, let's look at uh, two more verses here. Corinthians. I've got to tie this in. We'll start in um, 2 Corinthians 5. In 2 Corinthians 5, down in verse 11, start in verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, For we must all appear, Paul's writing to believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And then he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Well, I've got to show you this other picture too. Look at verse 1. <laughs> For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, what's he talking about? He's talking about the body that you live in. If it was dissolved, look up here. That's the picture. You live in a body of clay. Someday that clay, that body of yours, if the Lord tarries, it's going into the ground. And after a period of years, you're just going to dissolve into that again. The dust from whence you came, which Job referred to. Thou hast made me as a clay, wilt thou bring me to dust again? So now turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3. I'll try to keep this as the last verse we look at. This is about the judgment seat of Christ as well. 
It says in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 3, Now if any man build upon this foundation, talking about Jesus Christ in verse 11, gold, silver, precious stones, those are three valuable things, wood, hay, stubble, three dead things with almost no value, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day, that day, the word day is a specific reference to the judgment seat of Christ, the day shall be declared because it shall be revealed by what? By fire, and the fire shall try what every man's work of what sort it is. So in plainer words, judgment seat of Christ is for Christians. What are you going to be judged for at that judgment seat of Christ? Your works as to what sort they are. They're going to go through a spiritual fire. If they're done with the pure motive of charity, I know I'm skipping some stuff here, but I'm giving you broad strokes. Hmm. If they're done with the pure motive of charity, you're doing that because you love the Lord Jesus Christ, um, then they will come through that spiritual fire as gold, silver, or precious stones. If they're done in your own strength or with the wrong motives, then they're going to come through as wood, hay, or stubble. And that comes through as ashes. Because that's what happens when wood, hay, or stubble goes through the fire. It says in verse 14, If any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon, that's the gold, silver, precious stones, he shall receive a reward. God's telling us, hey, you're going to stand before me at the judgment seat of Christ? Guess what? If you got some works that actually survived that fiery trial, I'm going to reward you above and beyond the other things you get just be being saved. You obviously are going to get eternal life. You're going to get a glorified body. You're going to get to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ, everyone that's saved, all the apostles, everyone that's up there forever. But on top of that, I want to bless you with some extra stuff. Those are the different crowns that we can get. It says, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The worst thing that you and I can do is be saved, yet so as by fire. We have a picture in the Old Testament of Abraham's nephew Lot. He was saved, yet so as by fire. He, now, he's not a Christian. He won't be at the judgment seat of Christ, but if he was... He's a picture for you and I. Someone that lost everything he did on planet Earth when God rained down that fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't be like that. God doesn't want you to be like that. He doesn't want you to be naked and ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ. And those are very almost certain potential things that can happen if you're up there without any works because it's your works that clothe you. It's your works that build that spiritual house. If you like to sing that song, uh, I've got a mansion up in heaven. I don't know how the song goes, but that's the gist of it. You know, God said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. He didn't say, I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. He's got the place all picked out. You need to do those good works. I need to do those good works to clothe ourselves so that we won't be naked and ashamed. That's Revelation uh, 3.18. You can read about it. Uh, and we need to be clothed with our white raiment, it says in Revelation 3.18. So, Christian, uh, not because I'm here tonight, uh, but this message is important for y'all. Uh, so important, God didn't want you to just uh, hear it. He wanted you to see it. Because maybe that will help you, help you remember it and understand it. And then maybe allow him to perform what he wants to perform in you and through you. I mentioned at the outset that God has a perfect will for every single human being he has ever created. That perfect will begins with your salvation. So once you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, once you're trusting in Him and Him only, once you are born again, that is the beginning of you being able to please Him. You know, if you take that verses that I did full circle, starting with Revelation 4.11, then talking about the fruit and glory and so on, it just comes back to where, when you think about it, we're going to be tried at the judgment seat for how much pleasure we brought them. Because those are the works that please them, that glorify them, that honor them, that bear fruit. It's, it's amazing that Bible is like that, where it's like the infinity symbol. Uh, symbol. It's just there's no beginning and no end. That's that Bible, and that's, that's God's creation as well. So look at it. You need to make a priority to discover God's will. He ordained that we should walk through these works, but you and I can thwart that perfect will anytime we want. My prayer 
for you and myself is that from this point forward, I'll take more steps in the direction God wants me to take and fewer steps in the other direction. Because every decision we make is a step in one of those two directions, either closer to God or a little further from God. And it's a choice. Discover God's will, understand God's will, accomplish God's will. It's your choice. It's your choice. What God wants for each and every one of us is to be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've heard tonight. Lord, I thank you for the attention of the folks here tonight. I know it was a, a long message. Lord, I pray you'd use it to draw us closer to you. Lord, I know you, in your mind's eye, the moment you created us, before we were even conceived in our mother's wombs, Lord, you already knew the vessel you desired to eventually shape us into. Lord, help us to cooperate with your perfect sanctifying process that we might in fact become those vessels you desire us to become, that we might bring you the pleasure you desire us to bring you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Price.